Uh, this is also related to something that's been called the decline effect, and this was the subject of repopularized in, in a New Yorker article a few years ago, uh, which is a really wonderful article. And the idea is that if some effects that appeared very large in initial papers subsequently decrease in effect size when they're resampling. And the, the, the lead example here is um, an example of, of drugs that seem to work initially, and then as they're tested over the years, they get smaller and smaller. The effect sizes get smaller and smaller. And there are many reasons this can happen, uh, of course, in, 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 in drugs, including changing standards for how uh, diseases are diagnosed and, and drugs are applied. But a big part of this decline effect is likely just simply regression to the mean. Um, so anytime you have a false positive finding that you happen to find and publish, and then people start trying to replicate it, if it's not a true finding, uh, or if the, those findings have been picked out of a larger family of experiments that happen to work the best, then when it's replicated, uh, the effects will get smaller and smaller and they will appear to decline. So not so mysterious, but important. Um, and then we'll talk about circularity. And this is a, a way of thinking about brain analyses especially, and, and the kinds of analyses that lead to bias effects and how we avoid them. So circularity is also called double dipping, and which is popularized by a, a article a few years ago by Nico Quigas Corde and colleagues. And um, the idea of circularity is that you can select voxels to look at based on one effect or test and then test those voxels on something that's not independent uh, of, of that selection criterion. So this is sort of pernicious, but we'll, we'll, and, and so we have to really think through our results and analyses and be careful to avoid it. Uh, but here's an example, a work through example. So what you see here is a panel of voxels and this is a study with, um, with four conditions, A, B, C, and D. So now we've got the, green, the blue area here, which shows some true effects. And the true effect is you know, A and B activate, C and D don't. So now we're going to select data, there's the truth. We're going to select data based on this contrast A versus D. So we're selecting on A versus D, and we're picking out voxels that, uh, that show this A versus D effect. Now what's going to happen is any voxels I test later are going to tend to show uh, noise that favors A versus D. So then when I test, if I tested independent data, I would get about the right answer. A and B activate, uh, the other, other ones don't. But if I use that same data where the noise is favoring the A versus D hypothesis, then I'm going to get a biased effect. A is going to be greater than B on average, just by chance. So how can I select on A versus D and get an A versus B effect? Well, I'm conditioning on noise values that tend to be high for A. And that's not true for B. So I'm creating a bias. <laughs> and that's one of the, that's the, essentially the circularity problem in a nutshell. And that's one of the big dangers in terms of selecting ROIs and then testing them. We have to make sure that the data are independent. Um, and one popular way of selecting regions of interest is through contrasts that are orthogonal to the tests of interest. And so nominally you might think that that avoids the circularity problem. So I might select on a main effect of AB versus CD and then test on A minus B. Uh, and that seems on the surface pretty okay. Uh, it's, it's safer than a truly non-independent test, but there can still be bias if you test on the same data. Why? Because the design matrix, the, the regressors for, uh, for A, B, C, and D can be correlated, and that can produce effects. And also the noise uh, characteristics might, the noise might be autocorrelated, so the noise characteristics might also create a selection bias. So we do have to be careful even when we're applying orthogonal contrast. It's better to test on independent data. Um, this basic circularity phenomenon is one of the other issues that was raised in the voodoo correlations debate. Uh, and the idea is non-independent tests inflate these brain behavior correlation estimates. So this is a histogram from the literature of the correlation value for um, uh, for, for reported correlations between brain and, and, and behavior from the literature. Um, and as you can see, it ranges from about 0.2 to correlations of close to 1, which seem like incredibly large effect sizes. And what the authors here did is they broke it down into uh, those in which they thought that the, um, 
that the tests were independent of a voxel selection criteria and those that were not independent. And so you see independent in green and non-independent in red. And that's one estimate of what the inflation of the apparent effect size due to circularity or non-independent testing might be. So here are some solutions. One solution that we're going to advocate quite a bit later in the course is data splitting. Hold out independent test data if you actually want to estimate effect sizes, and we should want to estimate effect sizes. So this means uh, perhaps holding out a subsection of participants for a later exact test of the findings that you report, uh, and also maybe holding out runs if, if you're interested in making inferences within an individual person. Um, so a single hypothesis test of the model, if you, if you develop a model or a pattern uh, across regions that you can integrate into a single test, then, then if you're just doing one test on new independent data, then you can get an unbiased estimate of how big that effect is. Uh, we'll look at an example of this uh, later. And this principle goes beyond voxel selection to encompass all kinds of model building, uh, whether you're designing a fancy connectivity or dynamic causal model or, um, or a predictive model which includes multimodal data or anything else, really. The same principles hold. Um, and one really effective strategy we'll talk about later is called cross-validation. And what it is, it's an efficient data splitting strategy in which model development is done on one set of data, training data, and then testing is done on another subset of the data systematically. And we'll talk about that when we talk about machine learning later in the course. So let's talk a little bit more about selection bias in a more concrete way, and let's look at how uh, some forms of bias can combine with voxel selection bias to, iter to multiplicatively increase false positives. So for example, if I test two contrast maps, and I've got voxel selection bias in each contrast map, I get twice the, the false positives and a corresponding increase in effect size. Um, if I do two experiments, I get twice the po false positives. This doesn't mean that we should correct for multiple comparisons across every test that we've done, um, but what it means is we need to be mindful of this when we interpret the effects. So let's look at our four levels of bias, publication, experiment, model selection, and voxels and tests, and how they play out in, in neuroimaging. So this is an illustration of the file drawer problem. Uh, and it's not from neuroimaging, but I think it's quite illustrative. And what we're looking at is studies that have been of antidepressants that have been um, submitted now to the British Medical Council. And across the five drugs, we're looking at, um, at the studies that have been published in the blue lines, uh, right? Um, and the y-axis shows the effect size of the antidepressant. And so those are pretty high when we look at the, the, only the published studies. Um, but the nice thing about these drug studies is that there's a national registry where they have to have all the data submitted. So they can go back to the unpublished data as well and look at all the studies that have been submitted to the registry. And we see those in red. And what you see here is across the drugs, the, uh, the effect sizes in all the studies are substantially lower than they are in the published studies. And that's an example of the file drawer problem in action. Um, so here's the, the next section, which will look at flexibility in experiments and in the model. And this flexibility in choosing, choosing which experiments and which models and which outcomes that you want to look at after you've observed some effects and trying to optimize the chances of getting nice looking effects for publication has been referred to as p-hacking in, in the literature. And there are tests for p-hacking now that people are interested in doing. So this is one influential paper where they uh, um, discuss this and, and I think this is the paper where they coined the term. Uh, so Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson. And they point out that researchers have many decisions to make. Uh, whether to collect more data, which outliers to exclude, which measures to analyze, which covariates to use, and in neuroimaging, which types of pre-processing and modeling and correction. And the idea of p-hacking is that you make analysis decisions as the data are being analyzed, and then you want to create positive findings and publish. That'll create a bias, just like voxel selection bias. Some of the red flags for, for p-hacking uh, are the use of median splits in the data, the high and low responders when it's actually a continuous distribution. Why not use the continuous scores? Um, exclusion of many data points without really good principled reasons for doing so. Um, 
unconventional analysis choices or internally inconsistent analysis choices. So maybe the researchers look through lots of different possibilities and they and they just pick the thing that worked the best. Um, P values close to the threshold of 0 0.05 is one of the red flags that they they've they pointed out. You know, not everybody's p value can be just under 0 0.05. That's a, a, a flag for some effect that really wasn't significant and then you're kind of trying to get it to be more significant. Um, and then finally, unusual numbers of subjects without ex explanation. Um, and so journals have started to really flag those issues. Um, this is a view of the pre-processing pipeline. Uh, and this is a paper by Josh Karp um, from a few years ago. And what he did is he analyzed the same data set many different ways. In fact, he analyzed them 34,000 different ways just by picking different analysis steps and, and several strategies for each analysis step. So he has got almost 7,000 unique analysis pipelines, five multiple comparisons correction strategies, <laughs> leading to 34,000 maps. And so this is the mean activation across, his, across all of the, the analysis maps uh, and also the range. So the point is that there's a lot of variability, right, according to these analysis pipeline choices. Some of them are better than others. But the solution here for us is to really be principled and consistent in your analysis choices. It's not bad to have a good pipeline or to change things about your pipeline to make it better, um, but we should really make those choices in advance of looking at the results um, as much as possible. So here finally are some do's and don'ts uh, in terms of um, what we what we should should do to avoid selection bias problems. So don't is thoughtless analysis. I don't want to give you the idea that you should just choose everything in advance and run one analysis and then be done and not look at your data. It's really important to explore the data, to examine the data, examine the assumptions. The point is to get the right answer not just to get the answer that we wanted <laughs> in the first place, right? And, and getting the right answer uh, really requires looking at the data and making some smart choices. And sometimes we do have to change what we do um, based on what the data actually look like. Um, but we should do this in a principled way. Um, don't do uncorrected exploratory analysis with strong conclusions. So we can do those analyses, but don't go to town and, and sell the story and yourself on a finding that comes from an uncorrected uh, exploratory analysis. Do really work in advance to choose principled a priori hypotheses. We talked about using meta-analysis to do that, and that's in the next module. Um, and try to conduct adequately powered studies, which often requires a lot of investment of resources. Don't do circular analyses, and do do testing on independent data, or data splitting, uh, to estimate effect sizes. Don't do p-hacking, and do make principled choices, uh, and use standardized, reusable pipelines with sensible a priori choices. And finally, don't make heuristic reverse inferences. Uh, we see the insula activated that must be discussed. We see the hippocampus activated that must be memory. Um, there's a lot of spurious inferences that can come from that. But do uh, learn the techniques to make quantitative reverse inferences and really use those to understand what your brain maps are telling you. So that's the end of this module. Thanks for listening.